It's no secret that the Middle East has seen its share of war. In the last 24 months, we've seen the birth of the Arab Spring. We've seen the overthrow of dictators and the messy aftermath as new governments are being born. In recent days, things have become even more confusing. An American ambassador has been killed in Libya and angry anti-Western demonstrations stretch from Egypt to Indonesia. And of course, there is the unrelenting struggle between Israelis and Palestinians. No one knows exactly how to stem the anger. And so we wonder, is it possible to find a voice of sanity in all of it? This morning, we have the privilege of hearing from a man whose life has been formed by the very center of these conflicts. Sami Awad is from Bethlehem in the occupied territory of Israel. He is a Christian in a Muslim majority region. He has probably seen more conflict in his life than we will ever see in ours. And because of who he is and what he has experienced, he decided to do three things. First, he obtained an advanced degree in peace and conflict resolution from American University in Washington. Second, he committed his life based on Christian principles to peaceful, nonviolent reconciliation in his homeland of Palestine. And third, he established a center for nonviolence and justice in Bethlehem called Holy Land Trust. Today, Sammy lives in Bethlehem under military occupation, and here is what has made him so well known. He is working to end the Israeli occupation and build a future for his people in the name of Jesus, which is why so many of our students have already gone to Bethlehem to study and work with him. They go for two months or three months and they live with a Palestinian family, or they go for six months as hunger interns. You could do the same. Because of Sammy's work, he has become a sought after international leader who can explain to the rest of us how peacemaking might go forward without resorting to the easy choice of violence. It is a huge privilege for us to have Sammy Awad with us this morning. He is on a Midwest speaking tour hosted by World Vision, and we are grateful for them to host him as well. This is really huge. So let's give a gigantic welcome to Sammy Awad. It's his first time to Wheaton College. Welcome, Sammy. It's good to have you. Good morning, everyone. You respond here? Good morning. Good morning. All right. It is a true honor to be with you this morning and to be at Wheaton, and thank you for this very humbling introduction. Uh, I hope I can be a little bit of what you said, uh, but it's only through God's grace that we live our lives and walk every step of our day praying and hoping that in everything we do, we do our best to honor him and his name in our lives and our work. My name is Sami Awad, and I usually begin by introducing myself as a Palestinian Christian. And in speaking in many churches in the U.S., when I usually say I'm a Palestinian Christian, I get funny faces looking back at me. Because the assumption is that if you say Palestinian, that means you're an Arab, and that is true. And if you say you're an Arab, that means you are a Muslim. Yes, the majority of Arabs are Muslim, but there is a vibrant Christian community, not just in the Holy Land, not just in Palestine and Israel, but throughout the Middle East that has been engaged in being the church, maintaining the church, maintaining the holy sites for many, many, many centuries. Usually I get one or two church members who come to me after I give a presentation and say, well, okay, we understand you're, you're a Palestinian and you understand you're an Arab and you talk about this little history thing. 
uh, but when did you convert? Like, when did you really, really become a Christian? And I say, yes, there were sort of two points of converting in my life. Because our family as a family does not come from a Muslim tradition. We actually do not have in our history any time where we say that we were Muslims and became Christian. And what I tell my friends is that until somebody disputes this as a fact, our family's conversion to Christianity happened, I'm not sure of the exact date, but around 2,000 years ago during a time called Pentecost. And since that time, as I said before, there has been a very strong Arab Christian presence. Even if you read Acts 2, you will read the word Arab as the people of many people that heard the disciples speak in their tongue. I'll speak about my other conversion in a little bit. But before that, I want to speak about the land that I am in and to speak it not sort of as this historic uh, course or a lecture that I want to give you, but to speak it through the living experience of one family, my family, my current family. If you ask Palestinians and Israelis to begin talking about their lives, we may disagree on many, many issues. But one thing we will probably agree on is our starting line. We'll start by saying, in 1948, and many of you probably know what happened in 1948. A war broke out in the Holy Land in 1948. A war that led to the establishment of the State of Israel, which was a time of joy and celebration for many Jews and many Christians around the world when they saw the State of Israel established. But it was a time of war that also led to the greatest disaster for the Palestinian community that lived in this land. To the point that we actually label it in Arabic as Al-Nakba, which means catastrophe. Where the majority of Palestinians, Muslims and Christians alike suffered. And I just want to share the story of this particular Christian family. Seven children. My father was nine years old. The oldest was 12. A mother and a father who lived a very good life in a house that they owned right outside the walls of the old city. And you could just imagine the beauty of waking up every day and seeing the view of the old city of Jerusalem from your home. A house they owned, jobs they worked very well in, private schools that children used to go to, their whole life was set forth in front of them. They had nothing to worry about at all. And one of the interesting things that many people in the West do not know, especially in the U.S., that they had actually a good life with their neighbors. As a Christian family, they had Jewish neighbors and Muslim neighbors living next to them. Jews, Christians, and Muslims who lived in that land before that time lived in fairly good conditions. You probably have more ethnic social conflict happening in the U.S. here than the ethnic social conflicts that were happening there at that time. The only difference between these families that lived together, and not just in Jerusalem, in many areas across the Holy Land, was when and where each went to pray. For the Muslims, it was Friday, the Jews, it was Saturday, and the Christians, it was Sunday. And the rest of the time, they were fully together. So when you hear people tell you that this is a historic conflict that has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years between these people and it can never be resolved, I really want you to challenge this notion because this is not what it is. 
When the war happened, there was a lot of shooting and shelling right outside my grandfather's house. My grandfather, in an attempt to protect his family, decided to raise a white flag on top of his house. And he was shot by a sniper bullet as he succeeded in doing that and was killed. My father and his siblings buried their father. My grandmother was the only person to pray for the lost soul of her husband. A few days after that, we became part of what is known as the Palestinian refugee community, where over 700,000 Palestinians were moved out of their homes, and we became refugees spread all across the Middle East. Now the number has reached over 5 million. The biggest refugee population in the world that exists today is the Palestinian refugees. Now for a child who has experienced all of this, you can imagine what are their options. Hatred, anger, wanting to take revenge, to retaliate, even become violent towards those who did this to us. But it was my grandmother who was a very faithful person who really understood the teachings of Jesus. And she taught her children never to seek revenge and retaliation, but always seek peace and reconciliation, even with those who did this to us. Jumping into my story, I was born in 1971, four years after another big war that happened in the land called the Six-Day War that happened in 1967. So I grew up under occupation, under Israeli military occupation, which still exists until this day. One thing that you might not be aware of as you study the history and the politics of the land is that when Israel occupied those areas known as the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem in 1967, they never declared this land as part of the state of Israel, part of the proper land of Israel. They established a different set of rules for that land, even though it was under their control, which was the Israeli military operations. And we were living under Israeli military orders, orders that controlled every aspect of our life, our movement, our education, our health, our access to land, our access to water. Everything was controlled by military orders and still is until this day. If you asked me at a young age to define an Israeli, an Israeli for me was a soldier or a settler who was living in that land and they had guns and they were violent and they hated us and we were to fear them, we were to hate them, we were to avoid them. And I grew up as a child with a lot of anger and hatred towards those. And maybe different than many, many Palestinians, one of the experiences as a family that we used to have was the ability to come to the US to visit family every summer or every two summers. So the only experiences as a child I had were not just a Palestinian child. I used to come and visit my cousins in the US. I went to a place called Disneyland. I went to even a more popular place called Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> and we used to have fun and we used to play. And my parents and my uncles and aunts never told us stay off the streets when we played out in the US. But when we went back home to Bethlehem, we were told never to go out on the streets and never play. And this was part of this anger that I was having. My cousins in the US are living this good life and look at me. At the same time I was having this anger and frustration towards the Israelis, I had a different narrative of a family telling me seek peace 
and reconciliation with those who did this to you. And I was very challenged. What do you mean? Challenging my father, my grandmother, what do you mean following the teachings of Jesus as peacemakers? Look at them. They are not interested in making peace with us. They're the stronger ones. Why don't they begin a peace process? Why don't they show signs that they want peace? And then we could talk about peace. But as a believing family, they understood things differently. And it took me some time to really understand what does it mean to be a peacemaker, not just as a political peacemaker or a social justice peacemaker, but a peacemaker who follows the teachings of Jesus in his life. At the age of 12, I understood that being a Christian is not a label, a title that you have, that you carry from one generation to another, even if it was going back 2,000 years. Being a Christian means accepting Christ as your personal Savior. And I was blessed to have that opportunity to declare my love and my seeking of a personal relationship with Christ at age 12. At the age of 12, an uncle of mine who had been living in the U.S. also came back home. And he started teaching a concept to Palestinians called nonviolence. You may have heard about nonviolence. In the U.S., we have a powerful experience of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, or Gandhi in India. Or if we look at just the recent experiences in countries like Egypt and Tunisia, where the masses went out nonviolently demonstrating against dictators and demanding their freedom. And I began to participate with my uncle in a lot of this work of nonviolence. The biggest experience I had at that age was not in a demonstration I engaged in or a protest I participated in, but to see who was standing with me when we were engaging in these nonviolent actions. And I hope you won't be surprised when I tell you that many, many Israeli Jews were standing with Palestinian Christians and Muslims in these nonviolent actions. Jews who loved their country, who honored their country, and more importantly, wanted the best for their country. Knowing that the occupation of another people, the suppression of another people, was not the best for their country. But freedom and dignity and respect and peaceful relationship with their neighbors is what will provide real, long-lasting security for Israel. I came to the U.S., as Dr. Burge said, to continue my education. I did my undergraduate degree in political science and my master's degree in peace and conflict resolution. And being here for eight years in the U.S., I felt, like most people who come to the U.S., who dream of coming to the U.S., that now we understand everything. I got it all. I know exactly what I need to do when I go back. And the beauty of it, and I don't know how much you've engaged in your study work in this process, is that one of the methodologies that is taught in many U.S. colleges is a methodology called the STEPS approach. Seven steps to peacemaking. You've studied those? Yeah? And it's not just in college. It's almost in anything you do in your life here in the U.S. You want to lose weight? Seven steps to dieting. You want to become good at something? There are seven steps to it. And I felt, you know, part of the academic background that I got from the U.S. was the seven steps to peacemaking. And I went back home thinking, now I know what I need to do. But the reality on the ground is much more complex. It's much more complex than to say, oh, there are two sides, a Palestinian side and an Israeli side, that are fighting over a piece of land. There are complexities within each community. And there are complexity in how the international community looks at this conflict. The complexities even exist here in the United States. 
how churches are looking at this conflict and how they are engaging in this conflict. And I hope to be able to talk a little bit about that towards the end. So I began this work in nonviolence, thinking and assuming that I am doing what Jesus is asking me to do, because it's nonviolent. I'm being a peacemaker. I'm not hurting the other. Physically, I'm not hurting them. So this is what nonviolence is about. But a few years ago, Jesus knocked on my heart and challenged me not as a Palestinian. He challenged me as his follower. And he challenged me in questioning if I was truly engaging in nonviolence or not. And that challenge came through reading the scriptures, reading the gospel, reading Matthew 5, which probably many of you have memorized the Sermon on the Mount by now. And I was, as I was reading through it, three words popped from the Bible as if they literally jumped from the Bible into my face. And these three words were, love your enemy. Jesus was telling me, yes, I see your activism. I see you're engaging in these demonstrations. I see your desire to make peace and end the conflict. But I want to challenge you, Sammy, and tell you that my commandment for you, my mandate for you, my wish for you, if you want to truly follow me, is much bigger than that. It is to love. It is to love those who are oppressing you and suppressing you. Not just to love your neighbors, not just to love your family, because that's easy to do. But I want you to look deep into your heart and look at the places where you see anger, where you see resentment, And I challenge you, when you see peoples who do not agree with you, that we could label as an enemy, not because we're shooting at them and fighting them, but your neighbor who parks his car on your driveway and you get this little anger in you, in a sense, that is labeling them as an enemy. And what Jesus is telling me, like, look deeper into your heart and where can you find that place of purity? Because in this purity, this is where you could see me. And this is where I can work through you to make real peace happen. So for me, I started asking the question, what does it mean to love the enemy? And I truly surrendered my life, even surrendered my Palestinian identity, which I am very proud of, to God and said, you lead. What is the identity you want to create in me? Many of you come to the Holy Land as pilgrims to come and visit the holy sites, to be blessed, spiritually filled by the experiences and to see where Jesus walked. Well, Jesus decided to send me on a pilgrimage to a different country, a very cold country called Poland. Do you know what's in Poland? There are concentration camps in Poland, Auschwitz and Bergenau, where millions and millions of Jews and other ethnic groups were killed by Nazi soldiers. And what Jesus was telling me was, he was saying, Sammy, if you really want to follow me and you want to love the enemy the way I am telling you to love them, you need to know who your enemy is because your enemy is not a bad person. The Israeli is not a bad person because I created the Israeli 
and I created them in my image. And the Muslim is not a bad person because I also created the Muslim and I created them in my image. And the Palestinian, and the Jew, and the American, all are created in my image. You need to see what is the story, what is the narrative, what is the experience that makes them conduct acts of violence that do not align with my wish for them. So for me, when I talk about nonviolence now, yes, it has the strong component of ending the injustice, ending the oppression, ending the violence that has caused so much suffering for Palestinians and Israelis alike that I honestly tell you cannot be justified by any biblical text at all. When an Israeli mother cries for her children or a Palestinian mother cries for her children, they cry the same tears. No theological debate or argument would make their life any easier. Nonviolence is about ending these things, but it is about creating a new reality, a reality called love through Jesus Christ. And love through Jesus Christ means oneness, bringing that human family together, making all those humans who live in that land and around the world understand that they are created in God's image and they are fully loved by God. And Jesus gave their life for them. This is the call to the church. As I was saying before, there is a role for the church. The role of the church globally, the, lo the role of Christians globally is not simply to stand with one side or the other, to justify one's action and to find ways why we should blame the other for why their things are not going the right way. And in many churches here in the U.S., we are seeing this debate, this polarization of the church because we are either pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. This is not the role of the church. And the role of the church is not also to simply go and visit the Holy Land like how I was visiting Disneyland when I was a child, just to go on these tours, riding in air-conditioned buses and staying in five-star hotels and complaining about the hummus not being as good as we thought it would be. <laughs> the role of the church is to play an active role as peacemakers. We are called to be peacemakers. We are called to sit with Palestinians and with Israelis and say, this is our vision for peace. These are the values we carry. The role of the church is to engage. And I encourage you to seek that opportunity for you to engage. As Dr. Burr said, many of you have come and visited the Holy Land, and many of you were with us from Wheaton. In conferences that were held in Bethlehem or volunteering with us. And I can assure you that every person who's been there has had a life changing, life transforming experience. So we have many programs, including one program which is called the Palestine Summer Encounter, where you could come and volunteer, live with a Palestinian family, learn Arabic volunteer in the local community because people over there want to see a different you. You know how we have the stereotypes of how we in the U.S. look at Muslims? Well, the sad reality is that the same stereotypes exist on the other side towards the Christian community, especially the American Christian community. And every single one of you that goes to that land and meets a Palestinian Muslim family or a Christian family and just tell them, I am here because I love you. I care for you and I want to hear your story. It doesn't mean agree with them. I just want to hear your story. That would open, that, that, that is healing by itself. So my prayer for you as you engage in your studies and in your future to continuously look not just to that conflict in that part of the world, 
but in any experience that you have in your life. And when you start feeling these feelings of anger and hatred and resentment, to question yourself and say, how can I now open my heart to Jesus so that he would walk through, work through me in order to resolve these conflicts and these disputes? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you. We simply thank you for every day you give us to wake up and say we are alive today, to wake up and say we worship you, to wake up and ask the question, what can we do today to serve you, to serve your people, and to have your will for peace, for healing, for transformation be done in this world. Not for our sake, not for our political sake, not for our agendas, but your peace be done so that your name may be glorified. I ask for a special prayer on the student body and the faculty that you continuously and continue to challenge them because in these challenges, they will see you. Not to make their life easy, but to give them opportunity after opportunity to question everything in their life so that they would always seek and run to your face for love, compassion, and mercy. I ask you to bless the peoples of the Holy Land, the Jews, Christians, and Muslims who love that land and who feel this land is their home. And I ask you to continue working through the church so that they will see your light and your peace and your compassion in their life, so that they would create a peace in that land that would be a true expression of the kingdom of God in its presence, and that that small piece of land may be become a true light to all nations. I pray this in your heavenly name, amen.